Okay, what I want to do today is kind of uh, pull off of what we've been doing the last week, actually the last two weeks, dealing with questions. And so we're going to look at apologetics to Islam. Uh, this is a course that I teach up at uh, up in a seminary up in, in uh, Charlotte. This is a condensed version. And before we go into this, I want to first go over some aspects of reaching out to Muslims. This is always what I want to do at the end, but I never have enough time at the end of the class. So I'm going to start with it and try to pull some of these things together. In building bridges, we want to reach out to Muslims, and we need to understand what they believe. That's the best way to do it. And really, it's all through friendship. Whatever you do, this is the best way to find an opportunity to share, develop a relationship. Because in that relationship, you want to build trust. And you've got to get to know them. Now, they're often going to want to talk about religion. That's one thing I like about Muslims. They're not shy about talking about their faith, because it's always up front. They go to the mosque, and they have to pray, and they, they wear often different clothes, or they do things differently, or, or they don't do certain things, like uh, eat pork, and, and um, they fast during a month called Ramadan. So it's very obvious that religion is very much a part of their life, whether they're, they really believe or not, whether they're nominal, the liberal, or the moderate, nominal believer, or whether they're more uh, active, devout, um, they're still going to talk about their faith. So building relationships is not that difficult, but it takes time because uh, Islam is so ingrained into their life. It took uh, Nabil Qureshi five years of this constant interaction with his friend David Wood before he became a Christian, and uh, he was really thinking about these things. So. It is a commitment, but it's a, a neat commitment. And, um, and you want to ask good questions, but you need to understand more about what they believe in order to ask good questions. And this is what you want to do. You want to move them toward thinking about Jesus. Where does Jesus fit in? Now, sometimes you can use the Quran and know enough about the Quran and what it says about Jesus, because there are 92 verses that talk about Jesus that name him in the Quran, 92 verses. There are only four times that the, the name Muhammad is used in the whole Quran. Now, he's often thought to be referred to by the word prophet or messenger, and that comes up many times, but only to four times where you have the name Muhammad. You have Isa, Jesus, many more times. It's very interesting. So you can use that to develop your conversation, but you want to move over to the Bible as soon as you can and if you can read, get them to read the Gospels and talk to you and compare things, it really is uh, moving along because they have misconceptions about Christianity. And they especially have misconceptions about Jesus. And if you can get them into the Bible and maybe even have to push aside the whole idea of them saying, well, the Bible is corrupt, you can answer those questions or you can just say, well, let's just uh, assume that uh, this is... Uh, scripture, just like uh, the Quran, for, for sure, if, um, if God really wanted to, if God is powerful, he can surely protect his scriptures, right? You're saying that the Quran has been protected and it's accurate and it ha doesn't have any changes. Well, why couldn't he do that for the Bible if the Bible is his word as well? So let's at least assume that and let's read this together and see what it has to say. That's a good bypass. And a lot of Muslims will say, okay, with that. And then when they get in and start reading about Jesus, it just blows their mind. Because they've been told many other things except what's in the gospel. So getting them to the gospel is really, really important. And you can do that with your friends. And then, of course, you want to pray for them. Pray for them when you're with them. They're open to prayer. They're open to your prayer. Now, they may feel a little bit anxious about it if you pray in the name of Jesus, but pray in the name of Jesus. I'm a Christian. That's what I do. That's who I look to. And we can uh, agree to disagree. And that gives a good foundation. And, and that's refreshing to be able to have these deep discussions with a Muslim friend and accept him where he is 
and let him accept you where you are. And don't be afraid to couch things. You don't have to. They, they know that you're a Christian. They expect those things from you. So you have a lot of leeway in those relationships. And, um, and some of you have built those relationships. I think of the Sweeney's and the way that they've had their Muslim friends coming for years. Uh, students who are over there in the, the, the PhD program at USC and building those relationships, having them over for meals and talking to them and uh, <coughs> comparing notes and, and listening because listening is a very, very important aspect. You need to develop that skill more than, perhaps than, uh, than speaking sometimes. In fact, uh, this, uh, the past couple weeks um, with my class up in uh, Charlotte, they had to do an interview. And the whole purpose of the interview of a Muslim is to put together a number of questions uh, you can deal with the nature of God, man, sin, salvation, all, the, all those things, and just ask them, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about Jesus Christ? Why do you believe that? And they're just recording. They're interviewing. So they may have an opportunity to, uh, to uh, give a rebuttal or to bring up their, their views of Christ. In fact, many of my students have said, after that time, the Muslim will turn around and, say, and ask, well, what do you believe? Why do you believe that? And it gives them a great opportunity. And I've had some, I remember a CIU student uh, that I taught this technique to, and he used the interview, and he said, I had two Muslims come to the Lord, you know, after I shared with him after this interview process. So he was really excited about that, and that can happen. But it's the listening process and a asking good questions. And so one of the things I'm trying to, to ha teach in here is to ask good questions. Okay, um, this has been the, the primary verse that we're looking at, 1 Peter 3.15. It's our guiding light. It's the apologetic verse, the uh, one to defend what you believe. <clears throat> Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. The focus that I want to make today is on that word reason. Can we reason with a Muslim about what we believe. We need to be prepared. Are we prepared? You know, apologetics is often a strange word, but we use apologetics all the time in our discussions with anyone, whether if they are a Christian or if they're non-Christian. We're discussing, that's using apologetics, giving a reason for what we believe. First part of that, of course, is to understand. We need to understand what we believe and we also need to understand what they believe. If we don't understand what they believe, then they can throw all kinds of things at us and we may accept it because we don't know. We haven't heard about it. We don't know what to bring up. And that's not good. And there's a lot of misinformation that comes from, uh, from Muslims today as they deal with, uh, with Christians. So we need to understand what they believe. And we need to be able to defend what we believe. Are you able to defend the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the authenticity of the scriptures? Can you carry on a conversation? Can you show scripture? Can you show evidence for those things? Because they'll ask you questions related to that. And that's why a lot of Christians just shy away and don't get involved because they're afraid of looking like fools or um, people who don't understand or know their own beliefs. And that's why Muslims often bring up questions about the Trinity, because most Christians cannot go beyond one phrase. Well, we believe that God is three in one. Well, what does that mean? How does that work together? Christians can't can explain, and Muslims will say, well, how can you believe in such a ridiculous idea? One plus one plus one equals one? That doesn't compute. Of course, you could get to the next step and say, no, it's more like 1 times 1 times 1 equals 1. Or infinity times infinity times infinity equals infinity. I like that one better. Well, you need to learn to defend what you believe and refute error because they're going to have a lot of misunderstandings and you need to be, be able to say, no, that's not what the scriptures say. No, that's not even what Islam says. That's not what history says. This is what history shows us. And you can do that. You need to be able to do that. And there are a lot of good books that help. 
the books that I brought today to pass around deal with these issues, and uh, they're good in different ways. This is one written by Peter Townsend. He's an Aussie, and really good. Brings up different questions and gives the, the evidence that is on our side and explains their point of view and so on. So I'll pass this around. Questioning Islam, tough questions and honest answers about the Muslim religion. Another one I use in my class often is uh, one by Dr. James Gauss, Islam and Christianity, uh, a revealing contrast. He does a great job of showing that this is what Islam teaches, this is what Christianity teaches, and this is why you have to have a comparison and what, what is going on and why Christianity is um, uh, superior uh, in, in those particular areas. So that's also a very good book. And then uh, one that I've shown before that I also use is Answering Islam. It's been around for a while, Dr. Norman Geisler and uh, his uh, um, co-author, Abdul Salib, who was a former Muslim from Iran, uh, now a pastor in the Atlanta region, is the co-author. And it deals with uh, a lot of good issues. One of the best explanations of the Trinity, uh, Defense of the Trinity, Chapter 12, is one of the best you'll ever read. Um, I did an article on explaining the Trinity to Muslim, which I'll, Muslims, which I'll put up later, and it's based a lot on what they have written in here. So uh, Answering Islam is also a very good book. And the questions that Muslims will ask will always be at least these four. <laughs> so you need to be prepared if you're going to get to know a Muslim, because they're going to ask you some where along the line is God a Trinity. They want to know what you believe about the Trinity. Can you explain that? Is Jesus Christ the Son of God? Because they believe very differently. Are you going to be able to explain that and defend that? Because that's the core of our belief. If Jesus wasn't God, then Christianity is just a, a false religion and not going to help you at all. Did Jesus die by crucifixion? They disavow the crucifixion. Well, if he didn't die by the crucifixion, if he didn't die on the cross for our sins, then where are we? We're still in our sins. It didn't help us. So we need to be able to uh, deal with that. And there's only one verse in the, the Quran that even speaks about the crucifixion, and it denies it, basically. And then this question, is the Bible inerrant, or has it been corrupted? Because they believe that it's been corrupted. Why do they believe it's been corrupted? Because it doesn't have any prophecy about Muhammad. And all messengers before Muhammad should have had prophecies in there saying, and God will send, Allah will send a man named Ahmed, and he will be the final prophet. That's what they believe that these messengers, these other scriptures should have said. But since the Old Testament, New Testament do not say anything about that, then they say, well, they must be corrupt. They're, they're, they've been changed. But you can easily ask them, well, okay, when were they changed? Well, you've got all these different versions. You've got the uh, English Standard Version, you've got the NIV, and you've got the, well, no, 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 those are just versions. They're still going back to the Greek and the Hebrew or original languages. And so they don't even understand that concept. And so it, it, you can deal with this just with the knowledge that you know. And it's fun. It really stretches your mind. And one of the things that, um, that I wanted to point out in this is that, well, just going back to the whole idea of apologetics. Some people don't like the word apologetics. They don't understand it. We use it in everything. Even if it's just a dialogue, a friendly dialogue, you're using apologetics. If it's uh, refuting an error and saying, well, no, that's not true, that's not accurate, that's not historical, it's not scriptural, it's not theological. Uh, that's refuting it. That's apologetics. If you're defending and uh, giving good reason for why you believe what you believe, that's defending. That's apologetics. We use apologetics every day in what we do, in just countering or explaining or giving a reason. So it's, it's uh, all-encompassing. But this is what I find to be the most important thing. And this is one of the key elements of this whole semester, really, through learning, understanding what they, we believe, understanding what they believe, being able to defend what we believe and refute error, what we're doing is that we are engaging our own minds. 
Too often in a church like this, you have such good teaching week after week after week, and you're taking in, you're taking in, but there's no way to give out unless you have a ministry, and you get so stuffed with good stuff, stuffed with good stuff, <laughs> that you kind of get uh, lackadaisical or lazy. We're not being stretched, and that's the most fun part about being a Christian, having an opportunity to share about Christ, to share about what you understand. And we need to have those opportunities. And, and, and uh, dealing with Muslims gives us uh, an opportunity, or dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, or uh, Mormons, or atheists. But the thing is, when we apply this, when we go through apologetics, we it's pre-evangelism. We may not win a person to the Lord through apologetics. But we're going to clear the, co the, the barriers, the smoke screens that they put up, and build credibility because they'll realize, oh, this Christian is thinking. They're going back and they're checking their references and they're, they're really trying to answer my questions. I appreciate that. But what it's doing for you as a Christian is that it's building up your understanding. It's building your faith. It's giving you a better sense of the credibility of Christianity. And I think one of the, uh, the, the enduring ways that I have stayed um, involved as a Christian uh, is through apologetics, through constantly putting myself in a position of having to answer questions or to answer my own questions. Because I have a lot of questions that I keep asking myself, and I want to know. But what I'm saying is that apologetics sharpens you. One of the best benefits of apologetics is that it gets you involved either thinking about the information, going out and sharing the information, but you are growing as a Christian. And we need to do that every day of our lives. So apologetics is that way. Apologetics comes from the word apologia, which means to give a defense. And there would be the ironic, the peaceful way, that's dialogue, dialogos. And that may be, uh, it's friendly, it may be, sometimes it's too much of a compromise, it may be defensive, but uh, you're, you're um, and it may tend toward universalism, if you're just doing the dialogue, if you're just kind of listening, and you, you've got to, to press forward and say, wait a minute, that's not what Christianity says, or you need to be able to defend. And that's the middle part and where I have uh, under the two arrows, defensive or offensive. Uh, apologetics flows between defending the faith and promoting the reasonableness of that faith. So we are promoting the reasonableness. And so as I show here, uh, reasons for apologetics, preparing, defending, and refuting. Preparing yourself by reading and understanding both what you believe and what others believe. And then, yes, there is the polemics comes from the word polemikos, which uh, means war. It mean, it's more the confrontational, and sometimes it can be confrontational. But remember 1 Peter 3.15, with gentleness and respect. You can be bold. My Muslim friends don't mind it when I am passionate about Christianity, and I am bold about what I believe, because I give them that same opportunity. You believe that. I accept that. I'm trying to change you. You're trying to change me. I understand that. But let's look at what reason says. Let's look at what the history says. Let's look at what truth reveals. Are we looking for truth? Do we want to know the truth? If we do, then let's, let's read the Gospels. What are you afraid of? If this is true, then you need to know it. If the Quran is true, I need to know it. I'll read the Quran. We'll make that exchange. But it's an exciting adventure to be able to do that. And I'm not worried about reading the Quran. Because the more and more I find out about the Quran, uh, the more and more I find that it's historically inaccurate, uh, and it is um, a, kind of a mishmash of a, a collection of different documents that were, many of them were written before. It's just a, a compilation that is not the Word of God. And that is what history is showing, that's what uh, uh, archaeology is showing. And that's why it's, it's, in, it's good to be on the cutting edge of this because there's so much that is being revealed today. But that's what apologetics is. And we can learn all these things.
We can become sharper as Christians, and that's why I spend time on it. So anyway, these questions are the ones that you will be getting. And then a second major point is this in our biblical evaluation. We need to understand this. The core of Islam is diametrically opposed to the core beliefs of Christianity. That's one thing I'm trying to show, diametrically opposed. It is almost as if someone purposely developed a new religion that would specifically counter Christianity. And the more that I have researched uh, the, the history, the beginnings, uh, the early writers, and so on, the more and more I'm convinced of this. This is a false religion that was put together to counter Christianity at all the major points, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, the, the, the crucifixion, resurrection of Christ. It does it in such a powerful way. Now, when I was teaching at Ben Lippin, one of my favorite assignments, and Matthew, you did this in my religions and, and uh, uh, world religions and cults class, uh, was to have them, for, on the final exam, write down and construct their own religion. I gave them some guidelines, because we talked about all these other cults and religions, and, you know, it, it was basically there's nothing new under the sun. So I said, okay, now it's your turn. Put together uh, your own religion and make sure you specify these, th oh, these things. What are your basic beliefs? What scriptures are you going to have? And, you know, what, uh, what types of uh, traditions and worship and all that? And they go through. And truly, there is nothing new under the sun, even if they, started, if they said, well, we worship cats. Well, that's been done before. And there are people today that worship their cat. But <laughs> in, in all of that, it, it gave us a perspective that religion can be a money-making process. We, we think of uh, Scientology and uh, how that is quite a money-making process as a cult. And uh, Hub, what's it? Uh, wasn't Hubbard. It was Hubbard? Okay. He was a fiction writer, and he found a better way to make money, you know, create a religion. Well, the more and more I look into Islam, I see it as a created religion at that time that was kind of an amalgamation of Judaism and heretical Christianity mixed together in a monotheism that denied that Jesus was God and deny the Trinity and these other things. And who would want to destroy Christianity? At the heart of it is Satan. I think this is one of his best counterfeits. Now I say that in a balanced way. We need to be careful. But uh, looking at it, it uh, counters Christianity at all the major points. Better than any other religion that I know of. Uh, been reading a book by Sam Solomon. Sam Solomon um, is a, uh, an expert in this area on the Quran. I, I had him as a teacher at CIU on the Quran, and I really appreciated him because he knew the Quran backwards and forwards. You'd ask him a question, he'd start right, reciting it, a passage in, in Arabic, and then he'd translate it for you, um, and then he would explain what that meant and how it answers the question. Fiery Sam Solomon, very passionate. But in this book that just came out, Not the Same God, deal, deals with that question of uh, do we worship the same God. He said this, quote, Notwithstanding many apparent similarities, the Allah of Islam as expressed in the doctrine of Islamic monotheism, i.e. Tawheed, I'm going to explain that term, Tawheed, is the diametric opposite of the triune Lord God of the Bible. Opposite in nature, character, nobility, description, and attributes. You can't get further and still call yourself a monotheistic faith, a faith in one God. And you can't get further opposite than what Islam does with this uh, interpretation of God. He goes on, says this, The Quran, although seemingly innocent, has as its main objective to undo the message and mission of Christ. That's the second thing I want you to really pull in today. Islam is trying to undo Christianity, to destroy Christianity. I don't say that lightly. The more that I have studied it, the more that you will study it, you will see the same thing. And this book that was put together, the Holy Quran, 
is kind of a mishmash of verses. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, some scholars say that one out of every five verses doesn't make sense, even in context. doesn't have much context. And there's a whole uh, litany of, um, of writings on, on this, uh, this topic. But still, this book, and especially what is called the Hadith, the sayings of Muhammad, are directly opposed to Christianity. And that's one thing that we need to understand. These are the main areas. Islam is a direct attack against these particular doctrines that we hold dear. Uh, on the side of Islam, there's Taweed, this oneness, the singularity that I'll explain more. But it's contrary to the Trinity. They do not accept the Trinity in any way. Uh, the second thing, they say that Jesus is only a prophet, just a man. He's not God. Well, we believe that he's God. That's crucial to our belief system. He has to be God, incarnate in a body as well. Fully God, fully man. Thirdly, they say Jesus was taken into heaven without dying on the cross. Somebody else died on the cross. It only appeared that he died, as the Quran says. But that's central to our beliefs. And Paul says it well. If Jesus did not die on the cross, then we are in our sins. We are foolish. We are more foolish than anyone else. And we are. If we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead, and our sins are forgiven because of what he did, and it didn't happen, then we are fools. And our belief is empty, worthless, meaningless. Well, that's cutting right to the core, isn't it? And fourthly, they say the Bible has been corrupted. And we say the Bible is the trustworthy word of God. Why is it corrupted, they say? Because it doesn't include Muhammad. It doesn't prophesy about Muhammad. So it must have changed along the way. Okay? In fact, all the doctrines of the Christian church are attacked. Nature of God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, nature of man, sin, salvation, the Bible, nature of heaven, hell, future. They're all twisted. They're all different. And remember I said it, the differences make all the difference? Well, the differences are much greater than any similarities. And you're going to have people like Miroslav Bolf say, oh, we, they worship the same God. Look at all the similarities. One God, they want a loving God, and so on. The similarities are minimal, minuscule, in comparison to the differences. And that's why we need to understand so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at these differences and try to explain them. Okay, the first, we've been talking about the nature of God. We believe that uh, there is one God. They believe that there's one God. They call themselves a monotheistic faith. And uh, they will even call themselves part of the, um, the uh, Abrahamic faith. So we're all brothers or, you know, going back to Abraham. Uh, we believe in a personal God, though. They believe that uh, Allah is impersonal. You cannot know him. He's beyond knowing. We believe in a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They believe in a monad, a singularity, and they vehemently oppose any form of trinity. So there's this word, Tawid. Tawid is the fundamental belief in Islam that there is only one God. Well, that's good. We believe that there's only one God. We look at the Shema of uh, Deuteronomy 6. Uh, there's only one God. We believe in one God. Well, we're like the Jews, we believe in one God. And by the way, the reason that I would say that the God that the Jews believed is the same God that Christians believe is because the prophecies of Jesus Christ come from the Old Testament. And you look at the burning bush where Moses asked, well, who shall I say sent me? And the word came back, the name came back, uh, I am that I am, Yahweh, I am. What did Jesus say in John 8, 58, when the uh, Pharisees uh, confronted him? He said, before Abraham sprang into existence, ego I me, I am. He claimed to be the I am, the eternal exist, uh, eternally existent God. They knew that he had said that, that that's what he claimed, because they picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy, for saying that he, who was a man, they believed, only a man, said that he was God. He claimed that. So there was a connection, it's just that at, at the time of, of Jesus, the Jews who had been brought along as a chosen people, given the covenant and everything, they diverted from their path, they digressed, 
through um, degeneration and corruption, they turned away from the truth at that point. And that's why we need to bring them back. But they look to the same God. They just don't understand how they don't have a completed view of that God. That's why we, when uh, Jews become Christians, they often like to be called Messianic Jews, completed Jews, because they're brought back home, back to Christ, back to an understanding of who God is in his fullness. So that's where uh, the God of, is, uh, the God of uh, Judaism is different from the God of Islam. The God of Judaism is our God, too. They just don't understand fully now. Does that make sense? What about the Holy Spirit to the Jews? Well, the Holy Spirit was there. I mean, a uh, different sense. David had the Holy Spirit. Saul had the Holy Spirit, but he had the Holy Spirit taken. It wasn't in... Uh, it, remember, Jesus said, I have to go in order to send you the Comforter, and the Comforter will be with you and in you. And we believe that the Holy Spirit now lives within us as Christians. We are fulfilled in that way. The Jews did not have that same sense of the Holy Spirit, though they were led by the Holy Spirit. The prophets were led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was there throughout the Old Testament, but just in a different way. A little bit more external, you might say. But now he is internal. He is in us. So when we say that God is in us, with us, it's through the Holy Spirit. But what does a modern Jew say? What does a modern Jew say about that? Um, they don't put much claim on the Holy Spirit. And that's because they're still they're blinded, and we need to remove those blinders. So we need to take this material to the Jews as well. They need to understand that, that Jesus is the answer. He is the completion of the Old Testament prophecies. They're waiting for the Messiah to come. Well, we know the Messiah already came. He's going to come back. And we don't want them to have to wait until he comes back before they believe that he's the Messiah. So we need to uh, go out to our Jewish friends, too. Uh, Tawi um, is the Arabic word there, means absolute oneness of God, absolute oneness, radical monotheism. God is one. Uh, where does it come from? Because Tawi uh, is not in the Quran. But they will say, well, Trinity is not in the Quran. I mean, Trinity is not in the Bible. And that's true. We understand that from putting together all the way back to Genesis where it says Elohim um, created the heavens and the earth. Barah Bereshit Elohim. Elohim is a plural word for God with a singular verb. So it's very apparent that you've got a pluralism in the Godhead from the very beginning, from the very first verse of the Old Testament. And you could show that all the way through the Old Testament, New Testament. It's great stuff. But um, we believe in one God, and that one God shows himself as the Father, shows himself as the Son, and the Son is God. He shows himself the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is God. That's very clear. But uh, Tawid is uh, coming from a similar word. Ahad means one. Um, in the Shema, in the Jewish Shema, the Jewish word is Echad. God is one. So they're similar. But Tawid is not used in the, the Quran, but it can be brought forth from these other words. God is one, al-Ahad, God is a singularity, al-Wahid. And these two fit into that uh, same root sense of Tawid. But it means radical monotheism. Allah is absolutely other. He cannot be compared to anything. He cannot be known or understood. Even the attributes do not describe him so whatever you say about Allah is, can only be in the negative. He is not that, he is not that, he is not that. Well, we want to have a positive sense too. And that's what we can say about uh, the God of Christianity. God is love. In fact, John says it very clearly. John, God is love that, can, that kind of uh, encompasses all his attributes. Okay, this is where they get the, uh, the early idea of Dawid. This is the earliest verse that is said to be um, communicated to Muhammad. Uh, Surah 112, in the cave, when he first encountered Gabriel. In the name of God, the gracious, the merciful, say, He is God the One, God the Absolute. He begets not, nor was He begotten. There, in the very first verse, very first uh, part of the Quran, 
it's already kicking out Jesus as deity. It's already speaking against Christianity. Verse 4, and there is nothing comparable to him. So this is where Taweed originates. This is the basis of Islam. And it does not include the Trinity. Surah 4, 171 says this, Say not Trinity, desist. It will be better for you, for Allah is one Allah. Glory be to him, far exalted is he above having a son. They cannot understand how God, who is unknowable, can have a physical son because they always think of physical relations with Mary. And that's not what we as Christians ever believe. The Holy Spirit was the one who was uh, used in a different way. But Allah cannot be a trinity that's vehemently opposed in Islam. Therefore, Allah cannot be the same God as Yahweh. For how can the God of Muhammad be the father of Jesus? They reject the idea of the fatherhood of God. They reject the idea that uh, God can have a son. And yet that's the core of what we believe. And in fact, it's the greatest sin. The greatest sin in Islam called shirk is to associate another thing with Allah. And we associate Jesus, they say, with Allah. So we've committed the greatest sin. The unpardonable sin, really. Because for that sin, for that belief, we are condemned to hell in the eyes of Muslims. So all Muslims believe that we are infidels. We have committed the greatest of all sins. There's no hope for us if we continue with that. No hope of uh, paradise or heaven. Christians uh, commit shirk with their belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is the one sin that cannot be forgiven. In fact, Surah 48 says this, 448. God does not forgive the joining of partners with him. Anything less than that, he forgives to whoever he will. But anyone, that's us, who joins partners with God has fabricated a tremendous sin. Do you understand that? That is what the Quran says. We, as Christians, have committed the unpardonable sin in the eyes of Muslims. And there's no hope for us, as long as we hold to that. That's why they give us three, give uh, non-believers, especially Christians and Jews, three choices. You either, uh, when they capture a city or conquer, uh, accept Islam, become a Muslim, it's very easy, Just say the Shahada three times, and you're, you're in, you'll save your life and all that. So become a Muslim, convert, or die. We'll take care of that real quick. Or, because we need your tax money, we'll give you an opportunity to become a uh, second-class citizen, pay this jizya, this head tax, year after year after year, and consider yourself humbled, but we'll let you live, but you won't go to heaven. You're, you committed the unpardonable sin. Ideas have consequences. If you believe in Taweed, then you cannot believe in the Trinity. If you do not believe in the Trinity, then you do not know the true name of God, nature of God. And if you do not worship God in spirit and truth, then you are not worshiping the true God, but rather a counterfeit God. So in Islam, I believe that they are worshiping a counterfeit God. They may know that there is a God, he exists, that's the ontological idea, that's the general um, uh, revelation, there is a God. All people should know that. Men are without excuse. But that's as far as it goes. They do not know the true God. That's the no part. Okay? What I have here, in fact, we could probably pull this in because I have a, a list now of just the different ones. Uh, Jesus Christ, Christianity says he's the son of God, God himself. Islam says he's a prophet, only a man. I'm going to go through these very quickly because I'm just going to present them. We'll explain them more later. Holy Spirit, we say that the Holy Spirit is the third person, the Trinity, fully God. Islam says that, oh, there's a spirit of God, but they don't understand the spirit. Uh, they sometimes say that it's Gabriel, who's an angel, who brings a message to Muhammad. Uh, they do say that Jesus is the spirit and word of Allah. And John of Damascus uh, capitalized on that and said, wait a minute, if, if you say that Jesus was created later and he's the spirit and word of Allah, then where, then if uh, Allah didn't have a spirit and a word at the beginning, then he was incomplete. You've ripped him apart. You mutilated God. So he called him the kaptas, the, the mutilators. Um, nature of man. Christianity says that he's created in the image of God. Muslims will never say that. Oh, we can't be created in the image of Allah. That, he is so far above us. But we are created in the image somehow. 
We are fallen, yes. Islam says that uh, man is created but not fallen, only forgetful. So Adam just forgot who God was. He didn't commit a sin. He only had to remember and he could be forgiven, easily forgiven. God can forgive. Allah can forgive. Nature of sin, uh, Christianity says there's rebellion against God, separates man from God, original sin inherited from Adam. There's a tendency towards evil, and we all recognize that if we're honest. Every person who ever lived except Jesus has a tendency toward, toward sin. Let me get through this, Dick, and then... Um, okay, salvation, and I'll be explaining more of this later. We'll have a whole section on salvation, but Christianity says only in Christ... Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins against God. That's why it's so important to understand the crucifixion and the resurrection that he did rise from the dead to show and prove that he was our Savior and he was God himself. Islam says that uh, salvation is submitting to the will of Allah. The will of Allah is everything. And you do that by doing good works and having your good works outweigh your bad works. And uh, you have to have correct belief. And you, in the end, because you don't know, you never have assurance, you've got to give it up to God's mercy. That's all that they can say. They don't have assurance. As far as the nature of the Bible, we believe it's the inspired word of God, complete and without error. They will accept certain parts of our Bible, but they say it was corrupted. We've gone over that before. We need to be able to answer that question. We need to be able to show that the Bible is accurate and um, credible. Nature of heaven we say that's being in the presence of Jesus Christ. You ask most Christians, what do you hope to, to do in heaven or see in heaven the first thing? Oh, I want to see the face of Jesus. I want to be there. I want to see Jesus. You ask a Muslim, that's the farthest thing for their mind. They don't want to see Allah. In fact, they don't believe that they can see Allah. In fact, Allah will not even be there in, in, in his presence. Now, some will say that, but that's not Quranic. That's not according to their uh, traditions. Uh, but they look at it as a paradise where uh, it's a fulfillment of all their earthly pleasures. Whatever they can't do here, drink wine and have all these other things they can have in, in uh, paradise, and it's just free for them. Wine without getting drunk. That's what they're looking forward to. No sense of uh, the presence of God or wanting to be in a holier atmosphere. Um, what about nature of hell? We say it's an eternal separation from God, a place of darkness, a place of torment, perhaps. Well, it is. They also say it's a place of torment and fire, and all non-believers will go there. We have no hope. Uh, but not necessarily the final place for Muslims. Even Muslims who will start off in hell, they can get out of hell by uh, other things. You know, their relatives uh, dying, you know, for them in uh, battle, jihad. Because uh, the, the jihadis are promised that they can pull 70 people with them into heaven. And maybe those relatives that they weren't sure about, they can go ahead and claim them. So that's one of the reasons and motivations. But they believe all non-believers will be sent there to hell. We're among those. And then you get uh, nature of the future. We say that Jesus Christ is coming again. They do too, but a different Jesus. Different Jesus who will say you need to become a Muslim because Islam is correct. Different Jesus that will break the cross and say Christianity is wrong and uh, kill all the swine because pigs are not uh, looked, up, <laughs> looked up at in uh, Islam. All Muslims will eventually go to heaven, though some may be, must be purged in their sins first. All infidels will be destined for hell. So that's where uh, you have the, the doctrines are all twisted, all different. The differences make all the difference.